What does rock and roll and embroidery have in common? Or how much space do you need for a proper embroidery studio? Well, stay tuned and find out. Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. My guest today comes from the UK. It's Jane Sanders. Hi, Jane. Hi. Hi. Well, I must tell you, like I, I stumbled on your account on Instagram and I was stopped in my tracks because I have never seen anything like that. And like I'm Thank you. looking for new artists and I'm always uh-huh. like, I'm seeing a lot of different fiber artists, but your technique was like so very different that I was like, okay, I have to see how it's done. Okay, that's great. So like, tell me how is it done? Like, what's your process? How do you actually make those portraits? What's your like well, step by step? <laughs> so what I do, I, I sew portraits of rock stars. So um, my background is in painting and in portraiture. Um, so I got a degree in painting years ago. But then I had quite a big like hiatus in making work because of life gets in the way of what you want to do, doesn't it? So then when I, yeah. So when I decided that I wanted to go back in full on to art, um, I thought that I would marry my two loves, which was always stitching and sewing with music and create these portraits, like sewn portraits of rock stars. So to answer your question, how do I do it? Um, I start off with a drawn plan of the person that I want to do and I stick to that plan religiously because I can't afford to make any mistakes with the sewing machine. Um, I then start by sewing basic lines. I always use felt so I sort of try and sew key lines that will um, uh, really represent the face because some people have a very distinctive face and you have to get like their eyebrows right or the shape of their mouth. After that, I shade the piece, Um, but that's like a secret process that I don't tell anyone about because on Instagram, everyone's up for copying everyone else. And I like to keep a little piece for myself. To make the portrait seem more real, um, I add glass eyes because I think eyes really, um, really make or break a portrait. And then after that, I'll start to add clothes or different textures. So in a nutshell, that's how I do it. Right. Well, talking about <laughs> clothes, I saw you um, talking about one of the portraits you made and you were like, well, and the shirt comes from these boxer shorts, whoever yeah. that belongs to. So like, does your daughter ever find holes in her clothes? <laughs> um, n- n- sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Or I pulled a sheet out of the airing cupboard the other day and it had a big hole in it, right? <laughs> I cut something out and then I'd forgotten I'm really messy. So I just threw it back in. But if, when I started doing these portraits, it was a way of saving money, really. Um, if it's like, I need some striping material, so where can I find that? Look in the old clothes or look in like some rags or something. But then as I've progressed on more, I think it's quite um, ecological to recycle clothes. Right. Um, so if anyone's clothes wear out in the house, I don't throw them away. I put them all in a big box and invariably I, I use them later. So I think the best one I've done so far, it was a picture of um, Kevin Rowland. So he's the singer in the 80s band, the Dexys Midnight Runners. So his hat was made from a skirt because I needed some tweed. Um, his uh, neckerchief was made from like an old scarf where I cut it into a smaller shape. Uh, his T-shirt was made from my daughter's pajamas, where I just cut it, did some striped. And his jacket was made from uh, my partner, cut some big turnips off of his jeans. So he had some really nice blues um, denim left. So that was great because that used like four different things. So I, I love doing the clothes because it gives me a really good uh, like excuse to explore different fabrics. And I love different fabrics and the, the feeling that it gives off um, for for different portraits you know well so. I mean like when when I look at your at the pictures right on Instagram and I was trying to zoom in and see like the all this teaching that's done yeah like a lot of it is very sort of symbolic like there is a zigzag on the lips you know there's not like it's not like filled in there's just like a hint yeah. of sort of lines or like all this the lines of the face yeah just to like um is it difficult for you to stop 
sewing? Like, I mean, how do you decide how much is enough? Well, I just learned through experience, really. So when I first started, when I look back on those pieces, I think I would do them completely differently now. Um, so for whatever line you do, it is a wrinkle. So if, you, if you've got someone young, you know, we all have these lines down here, but sometimes I just avoid doing them because it ages the person. Um, but that's why I really like doing somebody like Keith Richards out the Rolling Stones, because he's so lined all over. It gives me a, a great scope to just really go for it and put as much line work in as I can. So yeah, it is difficult to stop. So, but I work very slowly and meticulously anyway. So um, I just have to be careful. But the machine that I use um, is a very, very old machine. It's a 1967 Singer sewing machine. It's right. like one of the last machines that was cast metal. So it really weighs a ton, you know? So it's quite a slow machine. It never really, you know, like a computerized machine would. So that, that's good as well, because it slows the whole process down. But well, I, I mean, know what people, you mean. People will always ask you, like, why such an old machine? Like, why can't you buy today's top of the line technology? Yeah. And use well, that? it's a good question. But I think, um, uh, I think it's so old that I can get it fixed. It's so mechanical, like there's nothing computerized that can go wrong. If something computerized goes wrong now, it's in the bin, isn't it? Right. But I, there's a, a really old man that um, I found that can fix these old machines. Um, it's not broken, so I don't replace it, basically. So I bought that machine in 1993, um, and that was £50. So I don't know what that is in dollars, but it's not very much money. Right. But I bought it from a market, and it's never failed me, so I've never replaced it. I don't feel that I need anything else. Well, so, let's, let's talk yeah. about how you like first started sewing. Like, talk to me about yeah. your story. Well, I'm nearly 50. Um, so when I grew up in the 1970s, everybody's hobbies was handicrafts and stitching, very like domestic stitching, making cushion covers and pin cushions. Um, but my mum had a very old Singer sewing machine, not the one I use. Her machine was black. It used to be a, a hat, like a hand, uh, I don't know what you call it, you know, where you wind it with your hand. Right. And then right. somebody had strapped a motor onto it, very dangerous. <laughs> so it then it became an electronic machine with a pedal. And she just taught me how to use it. Um, I think nowadays, health and safety, I don't think you would leave like a seven, eight year old child with a machine that looks like, <laughs> it's like a Frankenstein machine. Um, so I always had those skills. And then I went to like making my own clothes. And, da, da, da. and even when I was doing painting at university, I still incorporated like stitched work and kind of mixed media. So I guess my love of stitching really came from like that background in handicrafts, which is just domestic crafts. But that's kind of like what I like about my work is that I use the machine really that is designed for probably taking up curtains or making cushion covers but you can change it into something quite punk so you're using something very utilitarian and domestic but then you're making something like cutting edge and contemporary and bright and I also like that kind of thing where I make singers and the make of the machine is a singer it's like they were meant to be they were meant to be married together somehow well, I mean, to me, like, and probably to a lot of people, right, when people think about sewing, it's sort of like a craft thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Where are you taking it into completely like art form? Yeah. Was that by design? Like, where were you questioning yourself? Like, because you can make something wearable, you can make something practical, yeah, yeah. or you can no, just... Because I, yeah, I think like textile art really now is elevated to the same status as, as fine art. You often see in competitions now, you know, painting, sculpture and textiles. It's now suddenly become like uh, an art form in its own right. Well, I think a lot of crafts get delegated in, into, sorry, like a lot of stitch work gets delegated into craft. And I think largely without being too political about it, I think it's because women did it. Right. So when you see something like lace work, it's, it's a female um, craft, isn't it? 
and it's somehow not very important when you see like uh, tapestries from years ago it's all women that were making them and they're just as beautiful as old masters but they just don't get recognized because i think they're female based so people don't write about them um so yeah so i i think i think craft is in the same realms as fine art well as an artist right because you started as a portrait art artist when you think about selling your work mm -hmm. it takes you a certain amount of hours to draw or to paint on canvas right. right when what you do is complicate things right so instead of just painting it on canvas you then uh -huh. spend like endless hours teaching and and uh -huh. editing stuff and doing the applique which is like it could have been done much simpler much faster and yeah. probably sold for a similar amount of money like do you That's have right. Do you have problem pricing your art? Um, I don't have a problem pricing my art because I, I think rules are there to be broken. <laughs> um, so I just charge what I think, but I would rather sell to like music fans. And sometimes I will just sell to them in installments because I really want them to have it because I know that they really love it. And what's interesting about portraying like rock stars and musicians is I was watching, I don't know, like a, I think it was a Rolling Stones documentary the other night and Keith Richards was talking about the place of music in modern society. And he was saying that he feels nowadays music is the only thing that people can trust, you know, because politics is mad, the world is mad, you know. Um, so people start to think of rock stars and pop stars as like members of their own family. So I'm happy to sell to fans. Um, I think I undercharge. I think I do undercharge. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, what can you do? What can you do? So. Well, I mean, so you do different things. You do yeah. those portraits themselves, but then you do prints of those portraits and you do cards of those portraits. Yeah. Tell me about like that business decision, basically. Well, the, the, I, I believe that art should be affordable to everyone. So my original pieces are quite expensive for just like the average person. I don't think I could afford my own work, you know? <laughs> so I think it's unfair to cut everybody out of it. So I then sell um, prints of my work, beautiful fine art prints, which are cheaper. But then some people can't afford that. So then I do cards as well, because I think it's nice that everyone can have access to art in different ways. So I don't encourage people printing pictures of my work off the internet because I don't get a cut. But if they're really skint, I don't know if you have that word in America, really penniless, then right. go for it. Because I would rather that you just had it. So yeah. Well, tell me about your fan base. Like how did that develop? Who are your customers? Are they return customers? Are they like once in a time, lifetime yeah. customers? Well, sometimes, um, yeah, somebody, sometimes people buy my work and then they love it so much that they buy more. I sell quite a lot of work to America. Um, sometimes people just save up for a long time and buy somebody very specific to them. Um, or sometimes I just do a piece of work that I think in my mind's eye will work. And I put it out there. Sometimes I sell it, sometimes I don't. But invariably in my heart, if I feel it's good, then somebody will buy it. Because I think you have to have integrity. And all the time I'm trying to create something that nobody's ever seen before. I'm trying to create a unique item because it's quite unusual in like fan art to stitch it. There's a lot of people doing pencil drawings or paintings or what have you, but it's like unusual to see stitched work. So I think, I think that's why people want to start collecting it and buying it. I hope they do anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I saw in one of your articles or one of your blogs that you mentioned how you like certain faces attract you because of their irregularity and imperfection and how boring yeah. perfection is but tell me like more well, how do you pick those artists right like what draws you to them is it the uniqueness of the face or is it the singers that you personally like like how do you choose who you're gonna portray yeah well I, I usually am a fan of them because I'm such an avid music fan so yeah, I'm usually a fan of them and I like the iconography within the work. I don't copy photographs. Um, I try and get a feeling of the artist through their music or through their persona. 
Um, and also, you know, you'd get really told off for copyright if you started, <laughs> if you started copying photographs. Um, sometimes I'll just pick up on someone because they've got a really interesting face as well. Like if I want a challenge, um, I will pick someone like Shane McGowan from The Pogues because he's got like those wonky gappy teeth. I don't know if you know him, but he's got a great face. It's like full of character. Um, he's got teeth all over the place. His hair's crazy, his eyes are crazy. So say I've just done a portrait of someone very smooth like Debbie Harry, I'll fancy a change. So then I'll flip over to, to like Shane McGowan. So, and also he would be a great subject for me to start exploring different fabrics as well. So yeah, so in general, I'm, I'm usually a fan of the person, but I, I take commission work as well from people. So sometimes I am stitching people that I don't necessarily personally like, but I can still appreciate their face and the challenge of trying to make them out of fabric. So well, I mean, yeah. you're talking about challenging yourself. Mm. Like, What's the most challenging piece of work that you've done? Like, what was that moment when you're like okay I have zero idea how I'm gonna do that let me try well hmm, a big challenge for me um there's a, a band called the Manic Street Preachers they're a Welsh band and um I was quite attracted to their bass player he's called Nicky Wire and my attraction to him was when fans send him things he gets them sewn onto his jacket or he gets them incorporated into his clothes if they send in pins and badges, he puts them on. And I just thought that's a really lovely link between a fan and a pop star, a direct link. Uh, so I thought I'm going to create my own Nicky Wire. So I made a life-size portrait of him. I stitched a life-size portrait of him, but his jacket was just black and plain. And then I joined a lot of uh, fan forums. I mean, there's so many out there on Twitter and Facebook. It, it's great now, social media, because it means you can link to people all over the world like us, you know? Right. And I said, please fans, will you make me a patch or a jacket? It would be lovely if you sewed something, but you could stick something or make it um, be influenced by the band, their nationality, because they're very strong, um, proud Welsh men, uh, maybe their lyrics. And I didn't really know if I would get anything back, but then every day I was getting like a little envelope through the post and people had cross-stitched tiny little lyrics or uh, sewn little Polaroid photographs, um, patchwork, all sorts of, all sorts of creative things, you know, made badges. And I thought, this is great. I never thought it would work, but then the challenge was to um, stitch all of that onto the jacket to make an enormous, portrait of Nicky Wire, which in many ways was like a collaboration between me and the fans. I mean, so, were you overwhelmed by the response? Like, did you? I was overwhelmed because, I mean, I'm in England, but I was getting things from Hawaii, Australia, all over Europe, all over Britain, certainly. And I was because I just thought that once again underlined the importance that music plays in people's lives and the fact that they want to make things and craft things and sew things. They want, you know, they want to be involved. So when I finished that portrait, I didn't feel that I could sell it because I didn't feel like it belonged to me, you know, because we'd all made it together and I documented it um, section by section online. So people started to become a part of it. So I asked the fans where this picture should go. And um, we decided in the end that I would donate the picture to the Tenby Art Gallery and Museum. So the Tenby Art Gallery and Museum is in Wales. Nicky Wire himself had had um, an exhibition of photographs there. And so now it's on permanent display, but on permanent display also with the letters that the fans wrote me in a glass case in front of it. So oh. that's fantastic because it means that everyone that contributed can go and see it. That's yeah so that was a really great challenge right yeah and you're doing something similar now with Paul McCartney right I am so excited I am <laughs> I've been just a McCartney fan just all my life all my life and now like this is the year that he turns 80 uh, I thought I should really celebrate that so the idea is similar but I've I'm interested in Paul because he's the most prolific songwriter our country's ever produced worldwide famous but he's the most prolific um, writer of love songs, the most covered love songs in the world. So I thought I want to celebrate that. And 
I wanted to explore, you know, the heart symbol like this that people make. Yep. So, yeah. So I thought I'm going to portray Paul making this symbol in a plain jacket. I did a drawing for it like I normally do. Um, and I thought I would like to cover this jacket, absolutely cover it in love hearts. But I think the maximum size I asked for was two inches. But to make a kind of crazy psychedelic sort of uh, all encompassing paisley style pattern over it that is just blasts of you in the face full of love so i've been asking for that so so far i've had 45 people send in once again from all over the place so because it's like a kind of um i'll scratch your back you scratch mine type of situation if they send me a heart i send them back a thank you card with a drawing of paul on it and then when I exhibit the piece, everybody's names will be included because we've all made the piece. Right. So at the moment, I've just got jars and jars and jars of hearts. And then in October, I'll just amalgamate them all onto the jacket and just make the best portrait in the world of Paul. So can, <laughs> can my viewers send some hearts to add to Paul? They can, yeah, yeah. If they look at my social media, you'll find posts on there where I remind people how to get in contact with me and how to send hearts. So I, I saw a portrait of Dolly Parton and you mentioned yeah. somewhere in one of your posts that her hair was like 75 separate pieces. That's right. Um, how long did that take? Ages, just nights and nights and nights and nights of making hair. Um, anyone that's got curly hair is just a nightmare to me um, because I sew each individual from my drawing. I need to split that hair up because it's got to have like a textural element to it. Otherwise, it just looks like a flat piece. Um, so I, I split up the hair just into sort of manageable sections. But because her hair is so massive, it was like 75 sections, which I'll sew separately. I think I use gold thread in her hair as well, just to jazz it up. And then I reassemble it. So it's like a numbered jigsaw, which I then stitch all back together. So, yeah. So if anyone asks me to do someone and they've got like really big hair, I always think, oh, God. But it's, that is a good challenge. I, I'm, it's, I think it's good for you to do meticulous things. So if you didn't I mean, like doing meticulous things, it would be no good. Well, remember when I asked you if it was difficult to stop when you did all the facial lines? Yeah. OK, how difficult it is to stop doing Dolly's hair? It's fine because I desperately want to get it finished because, because like in the middle section, I've just, I've had enough of it. So I'm happy to stop doing the hair, but yeah. But something I, I would um, like to talk about as well is to sew with like unconventional materials, because I think there's a conception that just if you're a textile artist, that you only sew with fabrics and materials. Um, so something I like to do is like pick unlikely things to sew with. So is that okay to talk about that? Oh no, let's do it. Like what's yeah. the most unusual one you've done? Yeah. Um, well, when I did a portrait of Elton John, I mean, he's, he, I love him. He's so known for his like really flamboyant costumes mm -hmm. and on, you know, on stage he is in lights, Elton John. But obviously, like in his previous life, he was Reginald Dwight, you know, someone from like a very suburban, you know, normal place just like outside London called Pinner. And it's not the most exciting place, you know. <laughs> so I was used, I was trying to explore that dichotomy of someone coming from somewhere normal and suburban and then being Elton John and how I could like put the two together. So I got a roadmap of Pinner. Um, and I cut and he's got a very famous costume, which is almost like ostrich feathers coming off his shoulders. So I basically cut the pattern of the costume and I stitched it all together so that his costume was made of the map of his childhood. Even his glasses were made from the map as well. And um, the street where he used to live was just on the side of his glasses where, <laughs> where he used to live with his nan but it looked too dour. So after that, I did some like line work with it with like holographic glitter. 
I like it because when you stand from afar, you just think, wow, that's a jazzy, sparkly jacket. It's, it's anime. And then as you draw closer and closer and closer, the viewer can see it's actually cul-de-sacs and streets and high streets and stuff like that. I thought it was like a, it's like giving him history through his clothes. Right. So that was good. And I think going back to the machine, because it's so solid and metal, it, it, it's really good. It will sew through anything. I think it would probably sew through concrete. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just sews through anything. So anything unusual I can find that I think would build the narrative of the person that I'm stitching is great. And well, also to I mean, Tell me yeah. how, how those ideas pop into your head. Like, where do they come from? Like, where because do I'm they come from? Because I'm mad. <laughs> Um, well, because I think it goes back to that thing of I'm trying to create something that no one else has seen before. So when I do a portrait of someone like David Bowie, a lot of people do Bowie art and he's very recognizable. So I think you have to find like a chink that no one else has explored before because you're always as an artist trying to make people go, wow. So I used to love when I was a kid, the video to ashes to ashes where he's like a Piero clown. I mean, it was quite scary really, wasn't it? Because he was going along the beach and it was spooky and smoky. But I'm a, like a collector of items. I collect all sorts of things, Irana. Like there's no room in my house, but for some reason I collected joker cards, you know, from a deck of cards. Right. Um, because they're quite beautiful things and people just throw them away like they're nothing. But if you really look at them, they're very illustrative, really decorative and they're all different. So I wanted to do this portrait of Bowie as the Piero clown, but I thought it was gonna be so boring to use fabric. I use my Joker cards. So I was able to like form a sheet of these Joker cards as in a sheet of fabric and just sew it the, exactly the same way I would with materials. So yeah, so that was another good example. Yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. You know, like sometimes when I do a long, large project or something like I'm really excited about and I finish it, there is this period of almost like withdrawal where I can't think of the next thing. I'm still sort of mentally in the thing yeah. that I just finished. Like, do you get that also with your portraits? No, no. I see my portraits like eggs. So just as I'm finishing one, I'm forming the egg for the next one to pop out. I'm always thinking like three, four, five steps ahead because I don't like I don't like selling my work. To be honest, I would rather keep everything, but I need to, you know, earn money. Um, but no, I've always got the next idea coming because I know that I'm coming to the end of the, like at the moment I'm coming to the end of a piece and I'm slightly panicky, but I, I know I'm going to start another one. So, yeah, no, so I don't have any. If anything, I've got too many ideas, but I don't have enough time to do them. Do you so, sketch your ideas? Do you write them down? Like, how do you approach those ideas? How do you document? I'm really messy. I work in chaos, absolute chaos. I couldn't work. Like, I'm really jealous looking behind you of how ordered <laughs> all your worlds and everything in your embroideries are. That mine is just everywhere. So I just have a big notice board. And if I come up with an idea, I just scroll it down on a piece of paper and stick it up there. And that, that's how, just how I work. But if anybody else touches that notice board, I will know. <laughs> I know where everything is. So like if you open my drawers of cotton, they're just drawers all over the place. But I seem to know where everything is. Chaotic mind. <laughs> well, you mentioned at the beginning that if you would look at your previous portraits, you would probably do them differently now. Mm. Have you ever started something and it just didn't really work and use, like, do you ever scrap the project? No, it's, no, I've, I've been really lucky with that. Um, if, no, because I just really, really concentrate really hard. Um, if, and I'm not at the stage yet where I can be a full-time artist. I can't totally financially live off my art. I think it's quite unusual to find somebody that can actually, to be honest. Um, so my time is so precious. Um, so when I come back from my boring day job, I'm straight onto my art and I'm, I'm so conscious of the time that I've got that I really concentrate and I really love doing it. So fingers crossed, I haven't, I haven't messed one up yet. I don't think I have, maybe I have, um, but there's still time, isn't there? There's still time for that to happen. <laughs> well, I hope it won't. <laughs> yeah, me too. Let's, let's talk about that messy supplies. So 
how did that evolve over time? Like when you first started, right? Versus what you have yeah. now, how did your materials change? How did your supplies change? Well, it's funny you should say that because some of the things that I collected years and years ago, I, I still use now. Um, I do a lot of secondhand buying. Um, I think you call them like thrift stores, don't you, in America? Right. So we call them like charity shops. So I'm always in there and I think, oh, there's loads of pearl buttons. They'll come in handy. So I'll just buy them, then I'll squirrel them away. Um, but I, 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 I keep things for a long time in the hope that, you know, that will come in handy one day. And it usually does, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, years ago, I'm talking years and years ago, like when I was about 12 or something, um, uh, one of my dad's aunties died. And she used to work in John Lewis. And John Lewis is a big haberdashery shop. And she was a hoarder as well. So she had big rolls of velvet, high quality velvet. And even at that age, I thought, I know this is expensive and I know I'm going to use it. I know I want it for something. And then last year, somebody wanted a portrait of Dave Vanian. So he is like from the punk band, The Damned. And he looks very vampire. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, I know exactly, exactly what I can use. And I went back to that fabric from, I mean, like I say, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And I thought, that's perfect. I know I can use it. So... Yeah, so I, I collect a lot of things. I try and categorize things roughly. I, if I walk my dog, I pick up interesting bird feathers. Um, I, I'm always after all sorts of things, but now people know that I do that. People often send me things as well. Like, oh, I was gonna throw this out, but I think you could use it. So yeah, so I've got a, a room in the house that's just quite stacked up with all sorts of bits and bobs. So yeah, so secondhand found objects, things that people give me. Um, I, yeah, I would like to say it's recycling, but I think it's hoarding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's actually like, you know, it's collecting. It's not- Yeah, collecting, it's yeah, yeah collecting. It's, it's just a separate hobby. <laughs> it's exactly, yeah, exactly. But most things do come in handy at some point, even if you use one button or for sure, it's, yeah, it will. <laughs> right. Well, I know that you've had a few uh, solo exhibitions and you've done a few collective exhibitions. Tell me about that, like how exciting it is or how stressful it is to have an exhibition. Well, it's great. It's really great. So I've had three exhibitions now here in the Northeast where I live. Um, what's great is seeing your work as a collection altogether because usually it's just, you've got a bit propped up against the table, there's something, blah, blah. but to actually see a whole collection of your work is quite a thrill. Um, and also cause I try my, my work like akin to like the pop art movement. So always the figure that's um, elaborately stitched is always on a plain background because I think if it was patterned, I think you would lose the original figure. It wouldn't have the same impact, you know? but I just pick the colored background for what I think will go with the person. So they're all different. So that's another great thing about seeing the exhibition. It's just like um, a, a mass of color, colored squares in front of you, which always looks really impressive. Um, so yeah, so I love to do it. I always think you need about 40 pieces. Um, so I mean, now it's hard I'm, for you to choose them because you've done like over 150, 100, like I, I mean. Yeah, but the thing is, I, I sell as I go along. So now I'm in a bit of a pro now I'm in a bit of a problem of stacking work up because um, I'm quite lucky that I seem to sell a fair amount of work. So as soon as I've done a piece, I tend to sell it if I'm lucky. So the problem now for me would be to build up a stockpile of work and hold on to it. Um, but yeah, but I do hope to have more exhibitions in the future. Definitely, that's a goal of mine. Is there like a rule of thumb of how long a certain project takes? Like, or is it totally like depends on the portrait? Well, it, it depends on the portrait, but really about two weeks, about two weeks. Cause like I say, I still work in the day and I have like, you know, the other commitments that everyone else has got, but I reckon about two weeks. So I couldn't really tell you how many hours work that is, but let's say every evening. <laughs> 
well, every I mean, evening after like, two. So there's yeah. like part of you that an, an artist, and then there is part of mm -hmm. you that's practical businesswoman who needs to yeah. sell it and who needs to make money. That's right. Yeah. Does, does that ever prevent you from like going further into working longer on the portrait? Like, do you stop yourself because you're like, okay, I already invested that many hours. Like, it's enough. I'm not no. Really able to recover. No, I just, I just don't work like that. I just don't. If I've quoted someone a price. And then I think it needs more work because it's going to be excellent. I'll just do it. I'll just do the more work because I think if it's really going to be great, then I can then sell prints of it. So if I can make it as good as I can, I can sell prints and cards and it can still hopefully generate like a little bit of money that way. And also you're only as good as your last picture. So you've got to make it as, as, as good as you can. And I love doing it. Even, to be honest, even if I didn't sell this work, I would still do it because I just love doing it so much. Sometimes I just do a picture just because I want to do it. There's, there's no end goal. But like, hopefully someone else will feel the same as me and they'll want to buy it. Right. Well, when you said that, like, you look at some of the old portraits and you're thinking you would do it differently. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone back to the old portrait and redid it? Well, it's funny you should say that because I've, I've got an idea at the moment. So um, when about, oh, blimey, five years ago, something like that, I did a portrait of Ian Jury, Ian Jury and the Blockheads. So he's famous for like the song, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. Right. Um, and Ian Jury was obsessed with pearly kings and queens. I don't know, you might have seen them on things like Mary Poppins. So it's an old tradition where uh, cockneys cover their clothes in pearl buttons and make patterns and shapes all over them. Um, so I made him a jacket and he is in the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations because he invented the phrase sex and drugs and rock and roll. That's his quote. Right. So on his jacket, on his pearly jacket, I depicted the words sex, drugs, rock and roll on the arms. And then I encrusted it in the pearls. Um, he used to have a stage jacket that was like this. And also there's a direct link with him um, as when he died, he used a hearse, a traditional hearse with horses, with the black plumes on their head. And this particular hearse was used by the very, very, very first pearly king called Henry Croft in like 1870. So that's why I wanted to portray him like that. Now, the jacket is perfect. <laughs> But I feel like now I've become better at uh, more skilled at my work, I'd like to redo the head and the hands. So what I'm thinking is I might rip the head off. <laughs> I might rip the head off. I uh, leave the jacket and redo the hand. So I think I'm going to go back and rework that one because I can't face doing the jacket again because it was just oh god it just I took it on holiday with me and everything it just took forever but yeah I think I'm going to redo the head and the hand on that one so yeah I mean so yeah. like when you like you mentioned that you did it on vacation right how yeah. do you spoil yourself like if you don't work by doing like, this <laughs> your thing. okay uh, it's because it's always like my lifelong dream to be an artist Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an artist. I was so thrilled to go to art school. That's why I moved to Newcastle. And then, like I say, reality kicks in and you have to pay your mortgage. You have to look after your kids and all those things. And they're not necessarily akin to being creative. So now my, my children are grown up and I've got more time. I'm desperate to get back into it. So I'm already planning. I've got a week away in August um, and I'm taking Paul McCartney with me. It's because I'm driving. So I'm going to take this large, almost life-size sewn Paul with me. I don't think he'll need a seatbelt. But then I'm going to take all the hearts that everyone sent with me. And while I'm on holiday, I'm just going to stitch them all on. And that would just be perfect for me. Because I think if you like doing knitting and sewing, it's very relaxing, isn't it? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, how much of it do you do on the machine and how much of it is hand stitching? Well, it depends on the person. It depends what I'm doing. So I do all the basic line work of the face on the machine. I make the clothes on the machine, but then there's always an incorporation of hand stitching as well. Um, so when I stitch the hair together, that has to be done by hand or like parts of the clothes, they have to be stitched by hand. It really depends on the portrait that I'm doing. 
like obviously like the Ian jewelry I'm talking about with the buttons that all have to be hand stitched because I don't know how you do a button on a machine. I'm sure you can, but not on mine. <laughs> so it really depends on the person that I'm trying to portray and what, you know, what the piece needs. Yeah. Well, I can do, do both. Anyway. So, yeah. Do you ever do any work outside, like on, like on a bench somewhere in the park? Um, sometimes I work outside in my yard. Yeah, sometimes I will if it's sunny. But like I say, in, in Britain, you get about five days of sunny <laughs> weather and that's it. So no, because um, when I shade the piece, um, it really can't be touched then anymore. But I have to be very careful with it. Um, so that's why when I portray all, uh, when I display all my work it, uh, it has to be behind glass because a lot of people say to me oh you should do that on the back of a denim jacket or something I'm thinking I can't because I think the face would rub off and it's too delicate you know right. so yeah no so so most of the work I just do in my kitchen so <laughs> just surrounded by chaos <laughs> if you have like one piece as a permanent exhibition and museum like that people would see 400 years from now. Yeah. Which piece would you want it to be? Oh, wow. Um, I, well, at this point in the game, I want it to be that Paul McCartney that I'm making. I really want it to be that. There are certain pieces that I won't sell because I get too attached to them. Um, maybe because I'm like a really big fan of the artist's work. Um, I have a piece that I would like to show people um, that I won't sell. And they're a band called The Water Boys. <clears throat> and the guy is called Mike Scott, who's the singer. And his work's very poetic, it's very lyrical, um, it's very folklore -y. It creates images in your mind. Uh, there's lots of words of objects throughout this. It is like poetry. Um, and I just loved him. He was a very big part of me growing up. Now, remember how I told you I'm like a hoarder? Well, I'm a real lover of miniature things. So like miniature jewelry, uh, things that you were getting crackers, tiny little, oh, all sorts of things, little figures, lead figures. That are, so I have boxes and boxes of this, you know, little spoons, you'd imagine the sort of stuff that you would just see in a jumble sale, like a special button or a little pin. So I thought I need somewhere to store all this stuff. So I did a portrait of Mike Scott. Now in the 70s in Britain, yes, there used to be a sort of craft thing where people would make, uh, they're called peddler dolls. And so it was basically based upon like a traveling sales moment, like a gypsy type thing. So she had a skirt, maybe you would just make her out of like a rag doll. She had a skirt and it had a multitude of pockets on it. And she would have all her wares to sell her children, uh, to sell kids, you know, balloons. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought I'll use that idea that's still in my mind. So I created Mike Scott, this singer, a jacket, and it had loads and loads of pockets, some big, some small. And I filled the pockets with all my knickknacks <laughs> and all my things and my bits and bobs and my precious pins. And so it looked like he was a peddler, like these things were just spilling out of all of the pockets. And I felt it represented him because his lyrics and his music just spills out of him. And the same with all like the tiny beautiful objects. And I like portraits where you, a bit like the Elton John, where you look at them, you think, oh, that's nice. Oh, and when you go in closer, you notice this and this and this and this. Um, so I, I like high detail and I like really meticulous detail and I love tiny weeny things, tiny playing cards and yeah, so I mean, that was a great portrait. When you think about it, right, like you just told me this story so I can envision it and I can understand your idea behind it. Do you yeah. feel like it's your role as an artist to tell that story, to explain your thought process on everything? Or do you think it's like each person has to discover it for themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, art is so, you know, it's, 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 it's a visual art. So I, I think if you have to explain it, I think you failed. You know, I think people should look at that and get a sort of certain feeling of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah, I, th I think, no, I don't like to explain it too much. If somebody asks me, I'm perfectly happy to explain it. But it's nice when everybody has their own interpretation. 
And obviously, when you're coming into something like music, everyone's got their different Elvis, haven't they? Mm -hmm. I've got my Elvis, you've got yours. Someone else will think of him in, I don't know, you know, a fatherly way. Someone else, he'll be like the king to them. So everyone's got their own interpretation on, on the subject, I guess. But I, I am trying to get a general feeling across. Is there, like, like an, is there an artist that you know you have to make, but you haven't had that perfect idea for him or her yet? Um, I'm not sure. I'm still exploring David Bowie. I'm, I'm, I'm still exploring him because he's got so many looks and he's such a complex character. And he's so many different things all in one that I'm, I'm happy to do about 10 portraits of him throughout my life. So I'm always thinking about new ideas for him. If at the moment I've got an idea, like an egg forming, <laughs> um, that I, I'd like to explore his connection with Japan because he was obsessed with Japan, Japanese designers. So I know somewhere in there, there's an idea that's going to come out eventually. Um, but no, usually I find an idea for someone, but I've got to, I've got to create something different. I can't just copy a photo, you know, people have asked me to do that. And I'm, I'm just not interested in doing that. It's like, if you want to buy from me, maybe, you know, you, you must love my style. You must love what I do. because I can't just copy a picture because it wouldn't work. It would be soulless. I think. Do you ever <laughs> gift your things like the stuff that you make? Do you ever give them as gifts? No. <laughs> do people ask. Um, um, no, I, I don't. Well, I'm going to I'm going to start doing portraits of people I know as well. Um, so I maybe I might give them away if I'd like to do a portrait of my daughter. Um, so um, yeah, I'm going to start doing ordinary people, but it would still have to be ordinary. That sounds awful, doesn't it? That's terrible. <laughs> Um, but no, in general, I don't give them away because like you were saying, you know, your period of mourning, it's like I, I get really attached to these pictures and I really love them. So imagine if I gave them to someone and they just went, oh, we'll keep that under the bed. Don't really want, <laughs> don't really want to see that. So no, I don't give them away. No, no, I'm selfish. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. You know what? I think it's a good idea to like, do the whole exhibition on just David Bowie. That would be very interesting. That would be so older. good. If that would be so good, yeah. If I, think, I think I've done three portraits of him now. But really, I think the list is endless. If because um, if like I've got free scope to re really interpret anyone however I see them, right? Well, so, you know, there's this whole concept of like creators burnout that people start something, get really passionate yeah. about it, get into it, and then eventually something, the interest just fades and mm. they don't feel like doing it anymore. Do you see that happening ever to you? No, no, I don't, because I think the, the list of what you can do is absolutely endless. And I think if you're a creative person and you're not just into one genre of art, I think, I think the list is endless. And I think the people that you could do are endless. Like, for example, talking about someone like Kate Bush. Um, she's also had like so many different personas and roles. And, you know, she's been going for 45 years. So I've got 45 years worth of her music to explore there. Um, so she's someone I've, I've done three portraits of her so far. Um, and they're largely based around like I like making her hats <laughs> so, so I think because I love her music so much I think I sort of want her to be my friend <laughs> you know and then it's, I would love to like uh, like make her a hat so I was interested in the first one I made her a hat which had some very precious beetles you know like iridescent beetles on it um, then the second, I know, then the second portrait I made, I always loved the song Army Dreamers. If, and in the video, she is in camouflage in like an army helmet, going through bracken and stuff like that. Well, because I'm a hoarder and I like gardening as well, if I see interesting shaped leaves, I press them in a book. 
and I've got a big book where I specifically press them and I shove it in the bookcase and I shove books around it so it goes really tight and then I just leave it and I kind of forget about them and then when I decided that I wanted to do this army dreamers portrait I know exactly what I use because I think I'm trying to push the boundaries of being a textile artist and put different things in so I did my normal felt face machined it up I made her a helmet I used some fishnet tights <laughs> so I put the fishnet over the helmet and then I hooked in all of the pressed flowers from like the previous years and made her look like she was crawling through undergrowth but so that was the second portrait of her then the portrait that I've done recently only a month ago um people always describe women with big hair as having bird's nest hair and she's always had like this crazy hair and I thought wouldn't it be great to just put a bird's nest on her head you know make it like a hat so once again I machined her face and made it as realistic as I could with the glass eyes and the shading and then I made a bird's nest essentially I made a bird's nest I got the twigs uh, I still mounted it on fabric as a fabric base so I could stitch it onto her onto her head um and once again, I used some of the flowers that I pressed, things that I found in the fields when I'm walking the dog. Um, and then online, I bought some quail's eggs. Quail's eggs are tiny blue little eggs. Mm -hmm. And it, this was someone else's craft project. They, they blew the yolk out of them and they were for crafting. So halved them, filled them with glue to make them strong and put these beautiful blue eggs. Uh, in the nest which was interesting because a couple of weeks after that she became number one because her song was on Stranger Things you know yeah. so and then I hooked all her hair into this bird's nest so it looked like it was one and then somebody bought the picture just because they love her they just love her so and then I sent the picture to Ireland and that's where that is now but I had no no buyer for that picture I did it because I loved it and if no one had bought it I just would have put it on my wall have you heard of the Japanese uh, lady called Mary Kondo and her cleaning method of looking at every item and figuring out like if that brings you joy and if not getting rid yes. of that? Like that seems to me like completely the worst nightmare yeah. of your life, something like that. That is the worst nightmare <laughs> of my life. There's no way I could live like that. Because when I think her theory is, isn't it, if you haven't, is it if you haven't looked at it for a year or something, it's right. gone and then you don't really need it. Well, that goes, that's the antithesis of what I believe in. Um, if I haven't looked at something for a year, but I've still got it, that's because I want to keep it. <laughs> and in the future, it will come handy. No, no, I don't believe in throwing things out at all. Well, but when you look at things, right, like let's say those sleeves of flowers or buttons yes. on the shirt, like, do you have any idea for them or you just need to get them because you know an idea will come in the future? Well, usually the things that I keep, like the leaves or the flowers, they're just, to me, they're beautiful because I love miniature things. And I think the forms within nature are just amazing. So I can't bear for it to just uh, wilt away in nothing. So I, I'll try and keep it in a book. But in like about a month ago, I went into the yard and I cut off like lots of flowers and I have no use for them at all. I haven't got any idea, but I know in the future that I'll need them. And if I don't do it, it will be winter and there won't be any flowers. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so I just keep things that I think are beautiful and that will come in handy or something that's unusual. Like often some people will give me like a bag of buttons, you know. So I'll go straight through those buttons and I'll find something very interesting. And I'll think in my mind, hmm, that could be Billie Holiday's earring or that could be Dusty Springfield's hair slide or something. So I just get a feeling for things and I know that they'll, you know, they'll look great on something. But I don't necessarily know what. <laughs> well, if you think about your life, right, like, yeah, when I'm thinking back and I'm thinking, OK, when I was 20s, right, there was these things were great, these things were not so great. When you mm -hmm. look at your life, do you think like the most exciting things are still ahead of you? Um, I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess so. Well, I don't know. I suppose it depends how much energy you've got and what you find exciting, doesn't it? Um, I think in, in respect of my art, 
I think your skills grow with every piece. And I think you learn something new with every piece of work you do. You learn what materials won't work, what will work. Um, so I think probably my most exciting work is ahead of me. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, so. I get that sense from you that like what's, yeah. what's to come is going to be blow all of us I away. think so. Yeah. And as more children move out of my house, I'll have more room to make right. big, <laughs> to make and, bigger pieces. And more so, time. <laughs> more time, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think more opportunities will come up. Right. Well, I can't wait to see what else you're going to create. I'm like very excited to see every piece that you share. It's oh, thank always you. very interesting. And I love getting to know you and getting to see the process of how you're thinking, how you're coming up with these ideas. So I'm very oh. grateful that you agreed to be on my channel. Thank you, Jane. No problem. It's my pleasure. It was lovely to talk to you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.